Welcome back. We're going to go ahead and go through some of the steps with the nasogastric intubation. Hopefully you had a chance to look at the other video of the real patient um, becoming, um, having a nasogastric intubation placed. Some of the things that are important, and I'll just kind of review with the check, sh check sheet, want to obviously explain the procedure well to the patient to try to get their cooperation if necessary. Um, most of these patients are conscious. Um, and it's important that you tell them what's about to happen so that they can really participate and help you with the procedure. It also is important to have all the necessary equipment and you may want to consider having goggles. In fact, I would definitely insist upon wearing goggles, putting on a gown, um, covering the area because many times these patients are, um, they have coffee ground emesis, GI bleeding, those kinds of things. There may be fluid in the abdomen and many times they do uh, gag and actually throw up. So you want to really protect yourself as best you can. So come in looking like you're ready for the war zone. You should have goggles on, you should have a mask on, particularly if you think you're going to be gagging along with the procedure, which oftentimes happens, so you can actually have the mask on, which is very helpful. A big gown, if you're worried about your clothing, you really take your jacket off, put the gown on. Be prepared for the worst. Sheets everywhere, chucks everywhere. And to be honest, um, I know the check sheet says emesis basin, but Emesis basins are hard for patients to throw up in, so I like the trash can. I get the trash can, the patient holds the trash can. If they start throwing up, we're all covered. Um, so be prepared. The other thing that you want to do is take a look at their nasal passages, actually have them plug one side if, again, they're conscious and cooperating to determine if they've got, take a, a look up there to see if there's patency, if you see um, obstruction. Try to choose the path that seems to be uh, more patent. If it doesn't really matter to the patient, I prefer to do the right nares because I'm right-handed and it's just easier for me to use my right hand. So if, there's, if it doesn't matter, you get to pick, but if there's a reason to do one side over the other, choose the side that seems to be more patent for the patient. Um, you want to estimate the length of the so here's an example of what a nasogastric tube looks like. And you'll notice that at the bottom there are some um, holes. And you'll also notice that there are these little black markings that are radio opaque and they'll actually show up. Or actually, these aren't radio opaque, but there's a white line typically along this. Uh, on, it varies with the different tubes. Here's another example of a nasogastric tube that actually has a white line along the side. This is going to show up on an x-ray. And this one actually has a separate little port, you'll see. So it's a little bit different. We're going to talk about the different types of nasogastric tubes in the lecture. But you'll see that this one can easily be hooked up to um, a wall uh, suction. Uh, and so this one's slightly different from the, from the other one that's shown here. But basically, there's holes at the end. There's some uh, black markings. And there's the end that's going to be on the outside of the patient. So we'll go ahead and we'll use this one. Um, the big thing is to find the epigastric area, so you're just going to put the, the tube portion that has the holes down in the epigastric, epigastric area. You're going to actually, and again, this is not a sterile procedure. As soon as you touch the nose, you're, you're dirty and you're going through the back of their throat. You try to be as clean as possible, but you don't necessarily have to have um, sterile gloves. Um, you don't necessarily have to have, uh, definitely wear gloves, but they don't have to necessarily be sterile. It's not considered a sterile procedure. So you can actually be touching the tube that you're getting ready to insert um, and actually sizing it to the patient. So you can actually have the tube out of the package, finding their epigastric region, placing the, the area that has the holes, not the area that's going to be on the outside, down into their epigastric region. You're going to kind of estimate by going up to the angle of the jaw and you're going to go ahead and come out by the nose. And this is the site that I like to put a little piece of tape. So you're going to want to have some tape handy. Don't rely on the black marks. You'll get confused how many are in, how many are out. Is it the third one from the bottom, the third one from the top? I measured it, but now I don't remember. Just put a piece of tape. It's also helpful for the patient to see that piece of tape as you're doing the procedure and be able to know, oh, wow, I only have that much further to go. So the tape is extremely helpful. Again, making sure that you're taping the site where it would be right here, where you're going to end up, and to make sure that you don't get confused and are doing it upside down. Okay, So that's really to, to, to get the correct and estimate the, the length of the tubing. Again, we're going to cover the patient, sheets, trash cans, towels, be prepared. You're going to go ahead and lubricate the last few centimeters of this tube. So um, that little lubrication pack that we had a moment ago, we're going to squirt into maybe a 4x4. Four four. We're going to lay the tube into that. So let's just sort of pretend that this is a 4x4. Four four. 
right here. I'm going to squirt that little packet of lube and I'm going to lay that distal tube into that. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do is, again, at this point, I'm going to put on my gloves. Again, they don't have to be sterile. If you want to put sterile, that's fine. As soon as you touch anything, you're, you've wasted them. Um, you can, ahead of time, actually, before you put this in the lube, you can actually put a gentle bend and have this sitting in a cup of ice. Sometimes it's very nice to have a gentle uh, bend because it will facilitate the passage of the tube from the nasopharynx into the oropharynx. If it's straight, you're going to butt up, and in a moment you'll see on the model, butt up against the back of the posterior pharynx, which can be a little bit traumatic. The patient can bleed a little bit. It hurts a little bit. So having a tiny little gentle um, bend is helpful. So you can either try to do that. Don't crimp it, but do try to get a little bit of a bend. If you can't, sometimes just icing it will be really helpful. What you don't want is a real big bend because guess what? As soon as it goes in, and the posterior pharynx is going to come right back out and pop out their mouth. And I've had that happen many times and it's, um, you know, you, you think you're getting great success in the little home, little nursing home patient until you ask them a question, they open their mouth and the tube just pops right out at you. So, um, you know, pay attention there. But just a little bit is helpful. You can lay that again in the lubricant. We're all ready to go. Uh, this is a, a nice cutaway. This is an old model, but I think it's great because the important thing that I think people have difficulty with is realizing that the passageway is, so I'm going to use this as my pointer, my passageway is straight back. It's such a natural thing. Nose goes up. And want to make sure that you're going straight back. So in the nares, you kind of go um, up a little bit, and then once you're kind of in, you can sort of tip the nose back. It's a straight, a straight shot. So don't go up the nose. If you do, you're right into mucosa. It's uncomfortable. It hurts. So I think this is really important because it really demonstrates that sort of once you lift the tip of the nose, you kind of go up just a bit, but then straight back. Um, and so at this point, we're going to go ahead and tell the patient, I've given the patient um, a job. I think it's helpful for the patient to have something to do. Uh, holding the trash can is nice. Always give them some tissues in the other hand or have the box of tissues right next to them. Don't just give them one or two. Give them the box right next to because the lube may start to run. They may want to wipe their nose immediately after and you don't want to be searching around the room. So you've got your box of tissues. The patient is holding a trash can. The patient has got a cup of water if you want, um, if it's okay for them to have small sips of water. Their hands are busy. Um, that's very helpful. Sometimes if you put the bed up, it's extremely helpful helpful also, particularly if it's resting in the back of their head, they have nowhere to naturally back up because they will tend to uh, back away from you. You can also um, put your hand at the back of their head and then you know I'm aiming for my hand. Just gently, you don't want to be cramming it in. Work with the patient. The more that you can work with them and cooperate together, and I also tell them that they're in control. If they want me to stop, raise their hand, or, or um, it's hard for them to really vocalize and verbalize, but just you know, raise the cup of water up when you want me to stop, and I will. And you'll take a break, take a couple breaths, and then we'll go a little bit more. We'll take a break. But whatever progress you get with the tube, you don't want to take it all the way out and start all over. You really want to hold your progress wherever you are. In a moment, I'll actually demonstrate. So you're going to hold your progress right here. Let them have a couple of breaths. Don't just keep cramming it in. When they're ready to take a break, let them and work together. It takes uh, 30 seconds and you're down. You don't have to, you know, force it. Um, okay, so I think those are the big, the big things. If you meet resistance, things to do. Back away, back out slightly. Again, don't take it all the way out. If you meet resistance, back away slightly and try it again. Um, Turn the tube, rotate the tube often helps. You're going to meet resistance in the posterior pharynx. Once you get past that, there really is uh, little resistance. Um, so this is basically how I approach it. I get my uh, lubrication on my tube. I have already explained everything. We've got our plan. Everything's ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and start, and I'm going to insert until right there. The patient's going to start to feel like they need to gag. They may even start gagging. If they're gagging, I'll pull it back just a minute and I'll give them a break. Take a big breath, ah, blow it out, okay. Take a sip of water. As Soon as they take a sip of water, I advance and get as far as I can and then I stop and I hold where I am. Take a big breath, ah, take a sip of water, boom, 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 and I go and, I, and as you're doing it, tell them this is where we're headed, to the tape um, and hold 
you may have to do this two or three times. Don't just go all down in once. I find that it, it helps to break it into about three, three times, but each time I stop. What you don't want to do, if they're gagging a, a lot, don't just keep moving it past back and forth and back and forth that will stimulate their gag reflex. Stop the tube, let them finish their gagging for the second, for the moment, and just wait. Have a sip. You never want them to be sipping water when they're actively coughing, gagging, or choking, so don't have them be drinking water. But just stop the tube, take a couple of breaths. Maybe their eyes are watering a little bit at this point. The lube might be running down on their nose. If they want, they can wipe their nose a little bit, or you can wipe their nose for them. Hold your position, though. Don't take it out. They're going to want to take it out. Let it be. Hold it. Once they're in a good position where you feel uh, they're safe with their airway, take a, a, a little sip of water and advance until you get to the spot where you need to. And here we are, okay? And basically, those are the, the different steps. The most important thing, um, now that we're in, in a moment we're gonna tape and actually demonstrate what it looks like to, to tape it because again, taping is critical. Nothing worse than doing all this work, getting it in, and the patient pulls it out in their sleep. Um, you want to tape it, but not excessively, and we'll demonstrate that in a minute. But once it's in, you really want to confirm that it's in the right spot. So at this point, you're going to take out your handy-dandy stethoscope, actually put it in your ears. Don't forget that step. Seems like a, it would be natural, but I've seen people do that, actually. Um, you're going to want to select the right 60cc syringe, okay? And notice, this is called a lure tip, and this is... Um, forgot what this one's called, but taper tip I think it is. You want to select this one. You'll see that the lure lock doesn't work on these kinds of tubes. So you really want to select the appropriate one if you can. You're going to, first of all, you're going to um, pull back so that you have 60 cc's of air. You're going to attach this. And it sort of uh, takes a few hands to do this. I actually a lot of times just use my, my belly. And if you listen over the epigastric region and press quickly with the syringe, you're going to hear, hear a bunch of gurgling, gurgling, gurgling. That helps to confirm that you're in the right spot. The other thing you can do is actually pull back. And if you're getting gastric contents, that's pretty good indication. Some people say that's not good enough. Could be mucus. Who knows? Could be some sort of fluid. I mean, typically not in the lungs. But it's, it's really not diagnostic. The best the best thing is to get a, a, a chest x-ray to confirm placement, particularly if this patient um, is comatose and you're maybe going to be putting nutrition through here, something like that. It's really important to make sure that you're confirming that you're in the right location. So 60 cc's of air, you're going to listen, you're going to document that. You can actually pull back if you want to. Um, and then in a moment we're going to talk about um, taping. The most important part of taping is not to have this tube cranked up against their na nasal, their nares, the ala of the nose. Within even 12 hours they can have necrosis of that. So that's really important. I just wanted to demonstrate how to take this out because a lot of times uh, students and others are asked to actually remove these. They maybe didn't place them initially but they need to remove them. What I like to do again is show up with my 60cc syringe and and I'm actually going to, again, get 60 cc's of air. Why do I want to do this? Well, maybe this tube has fluid in it. Maybe it's been hooked up to a wall suction. And if you pull this out, first of all, all that gastric fluid is uh, the patient could choke, aspirate. They can also get a lot of burning in their nasal mucosa, and it hurts. So if you get 60 cc's of air and go ahead and just sort of clear the line, that's very helpful. Um, you're just going to, again, prepare the area with uh, sheets and all that kind of thing. I like to have my trash can handy. That's my best friend. And I'm going to grasp, untape, of course. I'm going to grasp the end and have them take a big breath. And as they take a, a big breath and they're at peak inspiration, I'm going to pull the tube out and put it right into the trash can. So... And I pull it out and it drops right in the bucket. Um, there's not as much drippage because I've cleared the area. And why peak inspiration? If you think about peak expiration, uh, a natural response when somebody's scared is to <gasps> breathe in. And if they're at peak inspiration, they've already breathed in maximally, they don't have a lot of <gasps> To, to go, whereas if they're expiring, they are likely to <gasps> breathe in and a lot of that can get aspirated into the lungs. So that's just a nice little um, thing to consider. And then again, document this procedure, which we'll talk about in class. And I think that's uh, everything that we needed to cover, so good luck and have fun on clinical rotations. Okay, we're going to demonstrate how to actually tape the nasogastric tube in place. This is uh, Stephanie, who is uh, helping us out today. She is a PA. 
Um, and basically, I like to use one inch tape, transport tape, not paper tape and certainly not athletic style tape. I like to get a piece about this long and rip it in half. And next, I like to do what, what I call sort of like legs of the tape. So these are sort of, it looks like a person and those are their legs. And maybe this is a little longer than what I needed, so let's get rid of that. Um, what I'd like to do is first put this big long one inch part, not the leg part, on the nose, the bridge of the nose itself. So actually do that first. And then I like to wrap each of these legs separately and independently around the tube, being really careful not to actually have the tube digging in to the nasal um, ala of the nares. And there are other methods, but I found this one works well. You can do sort of the, um, sort of like a crisscross is another method, sort of the, if you all know what the breast um, ribbon looks like, you kind of have, you know, sort of like a, you can kind of come down and around, but I find that this works really, really well. And so if this gets pulled, I reinforce it with one more piece of tape across the bridge of the nose going in this direction. And that's all you really need. I've seen tape jobs where people go across the forehead and on the cheeks, and it's really, really unnecessary around their, their ear. And many times, actually, this tube is placed around their ear. You need to be careful of that as well because it can actually dig in posterior to the ear. So pinning it to the gown is, is fine. And this is, you can see when it pulls, it's definitely going to pull here before it actually comes out. And this is a really effective way. And always check every day if you're the person on rounds to make sure that this tube is not digging in excessively on the ALA. Um, when you go to take it off, you can either have the patient remove the tape or yourself. And then we've already described how to remove the tube itself. Okay, thank you.